Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome once again to uh, Word Pictures. We're glad you've joined us again. Uh, those of you who are regulars know we're uh, deep into the book of Revelation. And last week we were uh, very deep into uh, chapter 17 <clears throat> where there's many beasts and, and they're trying to decipher what some of those beasts <clears throat> mean uh, and certainly may have uh, what we believe around this table some implications for the end time events. And we got so engaged last week we didn't quite get through everything. So we're going to finish up uh, this session what we what we, uh, I'm looking over at Ken over there, he's nodding his head, uh, where we kind of left off in the middle. So Ken has asked me to read uh, in chapter 17, once again, verses 12 uh, through 14. So if you've got your Bibles, if you're regular, you know you need your Bibles at this, uh, at this program. Read along with me. And once again, I'm reading from the, uh, the uh, uh, Good News Bible. Verse 12, uh, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet begun to rule, but who will be given authority to rule as kings for one hour with the beast. These ten all have the same person, I'm sorry, purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. They will fight against the lamb and the Lamb, together with his called chosen and faithful followers, will defeat them, because he is the Lord of hosts and the King of kings. Okay, thank you. Now, we, Jay was very cordial and uh, considerate as he said we didn't quite finish what we wanted to finish last time. So I'm going to ask you to back up for a moment to verse 9. We were talking about calling for wisdom and understanding. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Seven heads, seven hills, seven kings. What in the world are we talking about? Well, it's fair to, once again, to look at the Old Testament. Do we have any suggestions what mountains or hills might be referring to in the Old Testament? Do we know that? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the city of Rome has seven hills, and okay. often we, it is used as, a, as, a, as an indication that that's where this place is referring to. Okay. Uh, and the wisdom we're talking about here? You, you, you're ready to... Uh, All I know about the seven hills. Okay. <laughs> well, an example of that is found in, in Jeremiah. And um, it's going to take me just a second because my... Are you going to define wisdom for us? No, I'm not going to define wisdom. I'm hoping you know that one. <laughs> my computer hiccuped on me here, so give me just a second. Jeremiah. We're going to look at Jeremiah 51 and verse 25. And I'm going to read from, in this case, one of the more traditional translations, the New Revised Standard Version. I am against you, O destroying mountain. And Jeremiah 51 is talking about what? It's talking about the conquest of Jerusalem and, and Judah, all of Judah, by Babylon. <coughs> says the Lord, that destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you a burned out mountain. So here's a place where the mountain, the idea of a mountain refers to what? Nation. A nation, right? So if we have kings, that might refer, we often refer to 
kings as being representative of a whole nation. We had heads, hills, maybe mountains, and kings, so maybe this fits. If we can accept the idea, now, we, now here's some of the, as we're trying to draw some conclusions here, if we can accept, accept the idea, one, that God can predict the future, and two, that the devil actually exists, which some of our, many of our friends don't believe, and three, that the book of Revelation really intends to tell the entire story of the great controversy from beginning, remember Revelation 12, 7 through 12, talks about the beginning of the sin story all the way to the end, we're going to have in Revelation 21 and 22, where God establishes his kingdom here on this earth, then a much better fit would be to suggest that each of these heads represent a world empire, not just a Caesar, as has been suggested many of our friends who are trying to make it all crunch it down into John's day. So who, thinking of nations now who suppressed God's people, tried to enslave them, what, for, what nation back in history is the first one that comes to mind? Babylon. The first one to enslave God's people, the Jews? Egypt. Oh, Egypt, okay. That would be Egypt, wouldn't it? The next one who actually took the children of Israel off into slavery would be? I found Syria. my list. Assyria. Assyria. Yeah. They, they conquered the northern kingdom. Remember, Israel got, I mean, the people of Israel got split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The, ba the Assyrians completely wiped out the northern kingdom. Those ten tribes disappeared into history. They were slaves of the Assyrians. So we know the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. The Assyrians enslaved the Israelites. Then, of course, someone's already mentioned Babylon. Yeah, we know what they did. Medo-Persia left some of the Egyptians, some of the, I'm sorry, Israelites go back to Jerusalem, but most of them remained over there in Medo-Persia. Greece, remember the, 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 the king of the north and the king of the south? They were fighting over these Jews so forth, and Jewish territory, and so forth. Imperial Rome, what did, the, what did the Roman Empire do to the Jews in AD 70? Destroyed Jerusalem. Destroyed Jerusalem and hauled the Jews all off into Babylonian, I mean into Roman captivity. And then we come down, were God's people ever treated like slaves by Papal Rome? They tried to kill them, tried to destroy them, tried to get rid of them, whatever. I mean, that well, was during the Dark Ages? Yeah. So here we have seven powers down through the history of the world that really tried to enslave and destroy, whatever, God's true people. And how many of them were history in the days of John? Um, five of them. Five of them. And he was living during the sixth. He was living during the sixth and... The seventh hadn't come yet. The seventh, uh -huh. What did the verse say? Do you remember? Five of them have fallen. This is verse 10. Yeah. One still rules, and the other one has yet to come, has not yet come. Hmm. When he comes, he must rule only a little while. Okay. So this Rome, maybe, we're not saying for sure, but that's a possibility. Um, Okay, so where are these groups identified earlier in the book of Revelation? Well, these are possibilities. It, it, is not, it is not appropriate for us to forget the Bible and start teach, searching through history here and there looking for possible things that fit like a bunch of the names of Caesars. We must look carefully at the Bible and particularly the book of Revelation first, especially when we're using that little da or ha in, 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 in the Greek that says, that's one I already referred to. Uh, Ellen White made some suggestions, our founder for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is what she said about interpreting the Bible. Thus do many willfully pervert the will of God. Others who have an active imagination seize upon the figures and symbols of Holy Writ, interpret them to suit their fancy with little regard to the testimony of Scripture as its own interpreter. And then they present their vagaries as the teachings of the Bible. Great Controversy 521, paragraph 1. Then, Volume 4, The Testimonies, page 499, paragraph 1, The Bible is its own interpreter, one passage explaining another. By comparing scriptures referring to, the, referring to the same subjects, you will see beauty and harmony of which you have never dreamed. So that's what we're trying to do here. And then finally, 
18 manuscript releases, 145, paragraph 2, those who believe the Word of God as it reads are walking in the light, but the Bible is its own interpreter. So, so just as we have a divine trinity, it seems that Satan in his desperate attempts to imitate God is working closer and closer with his beast and the false prophet. So we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. That's a, that's a demonic trinity, isn't it? While at times these separate entities seem to be doing different things, at the end they are cooperating closely together. We read about that in Revelation 16, 13. So in Revelation 12, 16, back there, the earth seemed to have helped the woman to escape the dragon. Could it now be that the beast from the sea is the one and the other is the beast from the earth? That would suggest the eighth head is, a, is the dragon. So let's conclude. We are suggesting as the interpretation of Revelation 17, 7 through 11, the following. The one is, refers to the Roman imperial reality and not to a specific Roman emperor. Two, the other has not yet come, refers to a future that it was in John's day, it was future reality that supports the one. This defeats the idea of a contemporary interpretation. In other words, something is coming in the future that's going to support what the Roman Empire had done. Three, the beast that was and is not and is to come refers to the demonic reality that it energizes and uses both for its purposes. Can you define reality in this context? Yes, uh, I will try. Uh, I'm, I'm defining, I'm saying that reality here means the devil really exists. And this is a part of the big picture that we, there are, there are three entities in our universe that we need a particularly re, referred to repeatedly in the book of Revelation that we need, to, we need to be aware of. There's the God himself and what he represents. There's a group of angels and other beings in the rest of the universe that are a, th a second reality. And human beings on this world are the third reality. So we have to keep all three of these entities in, in our perspective as we try to interpret uh, these, these passages. You know, Satan cannot create. God can create, but mm -hmm. Satan can't create. So what Satan does is he copies closely. Mm -hmm. He copies and copies and copies God. That must be frustrating instead mm -hmm. of being able to create. Okay, now let's, let's look at Revelation 17, 12. We've read it already once, but the ten horns you saw are the ten kings who have not yet begun to rule, but who will be given authority to rule as kings for one hour with the beast. Now, Jay read that to us. Who are the ten horns? Can we figure that out? Well, we see two interesting expressions in Revelation 17, 11, and 12. The other, other has not yet come, and the ten horns that John saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. So both of these are suggesting that this is something that's going to happen when? In the future. In the future. Once again, defeating the idea that you can interpret everything in light of contemporary Roman history. So looking back over the book of Revelation, starting with Revelation 12, 7, and 17, and comparing Revelation and now I've got a bunch of verses, 16, 14, 11, 7, 19, 19, 20, verse 8, 17, 15, and 13, 3, and 4, we see that repeatedly the devil has brought about war and is seeking to accomplish his goals through war. So, who started the war back in the beginning? The very first war? Lucifer. Lucifer, in heaven, right? At the, standing beside God in the throne room of heaven, right? And down we see again and again, if we had time to read all these verses, we would see war, 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 war. Now, these are not shoot 'em up wars, are they? No. Are there wars of ideas and... Well, how would you try to fight against God? Um, cunningly yeah. devised uh, misquotes of his, I would use. Misrepresentations. So it, it did. It did have the effect of being a war, like any other war you've ever seen, because at the end people are going to perish. Yeah, people are going to perish, but not because of the war itself, really. Well, it result uh, the results of the war, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah, it, these are these are real wars. This is not. This is not pretend. This is the. We we refer to this as the great, uh, the great controversy or the cosmic conflict. Uh, this is not a, a nothing, this, but this is, a, this is a conflict between God and, and, and the devil, 
Do you think you could shoot God down with a cannon? No. No, it, it, that doesn't work. We've got to use a different kind of weapon in this war. And the weapon the devil, devil uses is lies and misrepresentations and slander and so forth like that. If it was a war over power, then God's a hands-down winner. The devil no question. admits that. Yeah. Uh, James 2.19. Yeah. Well, in Revelation 17, 16 and 17, let's look at that. We haven't got there yet. The ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. And here's the verse I was looking for last week in our discussion. They will take away everything she has and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and destroy her with fire. Now, we have suggested that these things are all supposed to be on the same side, aren't they? The prostitute, the dragon, the beast. And now what are they doing? They were having fun with her. They were, mm -hmm. they were in collusion with her and everything. Yeah. And now they're uh, stripping her naked and throwing her away. Yeah. Hmm. And it's interesting to notice what it says next. For God has placed in their hearts the will to carry out his purpose, his purpose, by acting together and giving the beast their power to rule until God's words come true. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Once again, suggesting that Babylon idea, great Babylon, right? So, we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about that. That reminds me about uh, a lot of faith that prostitutes go, that they become. They, yeah. they become murdered by their own um, clients yeah and so this could be happening again that the whole way of life may not turn be turning out as way as well as the devil claimed mm -hmm. okay so now we have suggested <coughs> the dragon makes one last attempt to win the war that began in heaven that's what we seem to be happening here he works through his surrogates pursuing a strategy of imitation to get people to think he is God we've seen that repeatedly the woman in Revelation 17 is related in origin, but not in character, the woman in Revelation 12. In other words, this woman who disappeared into the desert as a pure woman, either she disappears completely and another woman is there, but it seems to suggest that she turns into a famous prostitute. So she is completely corrupted. For the imperial reality of John's day, the beast from the sea, persists until the end of time. So this Roman entity, whatever it is, never goes away completely. It changes, but it doesn't go away. There will be a time of fervent political and religious unity at the end of time. Remember Revelation 13 says the whole world wanders after the beast. The beast. Yeah. The unity will be broken and the woman will be destroyed by those who previously supported her. The verse we just read, Revelation 17, 16. God wins the cosmic conflict by a strategy of clarification and revelation and not by a strategy of force. What do we mean by that? At the end, God allows Satan to, to, to have all, to really almost have complete control here on this earth. And what does he do? He proves that he's the kind of person that God has always claimed that he was. The devil has lied about it all through the years. And now God opens a door and the devil becomes so angry, so upset that he's, he's, he's about to be destroyed. He's trying to kill God's people and he's killing millions of his own people in the process. And what does that, what does that teach us? It teach us about his very, very character, his very nature, right? Yeah. Then the bottomless pit, the abyss that is to come, and the eighth are features of the demonic. The, the is not is really the demonic forces, even though it was tra has traditionally been understood to be the Roman imperial or possibly Roman ecclesiastical power. So, and, and we've suggested that at times, the Rome, for example, the Pope was taken captive, that's a possibility. We've looked at the time when the dragon went away and then later he comes back, it seemed like he's gone for a while. And finally, nine, the ten horns represent ten kings that are still, were still future in John's day and probably are the same, same ten kingdoms mentioned as the toes in Daniel 2. So uh, <clears throat> what we're looking at here are kind of the, uh, the details <clears throat> of, uh, of Satan's in the end time 
uh, basically his last stand yep. in his effort to to um, gain the hearts and the minds and the souls of other yeah. uh, of human beings here yeah. to his side. Now I'm sure many of you have felt like, well, you maybe even turned us off. You said this is just too complicated. There's no question about the fact that Revelation 17 is a challenge. Uh, we have suggested that the one referred to in Revelation 17.10 is a sixth header king and probably refers to the beast from the sea. We've talked about the other Revelation 17.10 as the seventh header king with the beast from the earth. And then the beast that once was alive but is no longer, we believe, was Satan himself. Today it is our hope to look over the ending of Revelation chapter 17, trying to be as specific as we can dare to be in understanding these final verses of the chapter. We will divide this final picture into three aspects, reviewing the characters in the story. We've been focusing a lot on that already, trying to identify the characters. Then two, reviewing the story itself, and finally, making an attempt at least to understand the plot behind the story. So what really matters in all of this? What we really want to know is what the devil and what God are doing behind the scenes, right? That's the ultimate thing we want to know, right? So if I don't understand all of this, should I just kind of give up and go read some other parts and understand those parts? Well, there's two or three things we can say for sure. Despite the devil's, we can say for sure from what we've read, despite every possible thing that the devil can think of and do, we know that in the end God is going to win. He's going to end up by recreating this earth to make a new heaven and a new earth, and so we can rest assured that that is going to be the final outcome. Now, we think it's important to, we're going through all this to try and understand how God wins. God doesn't win by force, because if he won by force, we're going to ask the question, well, why didn't he do it way back in the beginning? Why waste time messing with the devil? Why not just wipe him out back in the beginning? So that's where we're going. We want to, we want to see if we can clearly explain how God wins, okay? Um, so with our eyes on the ending, let us begin with Revelation 17, 12. It will be our goal to identify the ten horns, which are ten kings who have not yet come. Revelation 17 tells us that they will come together for one hour, and there's no way to fit this with any group in Imperial Roman Empire or any interpretation of the imperial cult of ancient Rome. It, it, I mean, you can't have ten the Caesars came one by one. You can't have ten of them all of a sudden coming together for a period of one hour to do something. I mean, what do you do? So the people who try to put all this together, they're just stumbling around over themselves. So you're speaking of the other Christian groups. Different Christian groups have different interpretations of Revelation. You know what I'm seeing from Revelation and all this? Uh, God wants to reach a goal, but he has a very pure method truthful method to get there. Satan wants to reach a goal and he pulls every trick, deception, lie in the book to get there. Mm -hmm. And I think the principle of the universe is if you do Satan's route, you may reach the goal for maybe one hour, but then you destroy yourself. It, yeah. uh, that's just a law like gravity. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's in the process. Yeah. Does it seem possible to you? Let's, let's talk about our friend's interpretation, our other Christian friend's interpretation. Does it seem possible to you that the whole world is going to rally around imperial Rome at some time in the future? Not likely, right? No. Not We're not going to have another Caesar. So we feel that this is a compelling argument in favor of the idea that this is not all happening in John's day. There's, there's something longer term going on here. Um, look at Revelation 17, 13 and 14, <clears throat> two of the verses that Jay read to us early and let, earlier, and let's see if we can nail them down. These ten all have the same purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. Could that have something to do with coming together as a United Nations, maybe? Mm -hmm. They will fight against the Lamb, but the Lamb, together with His called, chosen, and faithful followers, will defeat them, because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. 
So these 10 kings' horns voluntarily come together. They give their power and authority to make war against the Lamb. So again, we're going to say these and they, those are articles in the Greek, and we have suggested that articles in the Greek means they're referring to some specific entities that have been talked about already. That have okay. been talked about in the book of Revelation already. Yeah. And they will make war. Who is this speaking about? Clearly, these are united, refers to the kings and horns. I mean, it's very clear in the passage there. And when it says they will make war, does that include all the horns? Let's look at that again. Does it include all the horns? Does it, does it go back and include, you know, the up earlier verses that talk about, if you go back up here, we're talking about the devil, we're talking about other kingdom and so forth. Or does it just talk about the when verse is 13 to 14, is that just talking about, it says these 10 in my good news Bible, but it's not always perfectly clear that it's just referring to the 10. Okay. So, is this what kind of war? We spoke about that just a moment. A spiritual war, a war of ideas. It can't be cannons and, and, and shotguns and that kind of stuff. That doesn't, obviously doesn't fit. One hour is not a very long time. No. Even a prophetic hour, how long is a prophetic hour? Two weeks. About two weeks. That's still a very short period of time. Why couldn't it be both kinds of wars? We're going to have to make many yeah. choices. And if, as you said, in the end, the, the ten kingdoms mentioned in Daniel 2, they're the basic nations that formed in Europe as we know it, and all mm -hmm. the modern nations came out of it. Yeah. And all of these gave power to the beast. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a bit of everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and you can be sure that the devil is going to use every weapon that he can get his hands on. Mm -hmm. You know, ideas, literal weapons, whatever. I think we're going to suggest when we get to the final end after the, after the um, millennium that the devil is going to get all his weapons together and then he's going to discover, hey, there's nothing to shoot at. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> okay. Well, we, we read several times already Revelation 12, verses 7 and 17, particularly uh, uh, 7, that talks about making war, making war, making war. But we, we, we are reminded here that Revelation really is focusing on the end. So what's this great final war? Well, what do we call the great final war? There's a name for it. Armageddon. Armageddon. And we notice in Revelation 12, 17, if we want to dro drop back there again, the dragon was furious with the woman, went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. The rest, sometimes that's uh, interpreted as remnant. What, what, what group is that talking about? Well, that's usually interpreted as the, uh, the faithful Christians. Living at what time? time? At the end of time. I mean, that yeah. may even be... If you go to a linen store and you buy a remnant, how much, is, how much of, the linen, of that particular piece of cloth is already gone? All of it except the last little bit, right? The, the last little bits are the remnants, right? So there's going to be people at the end of the world that are going to be as faithful as Jesus' disciples were at the, at the beginning of after Jesus died. So all of this is going to suggest we're going to, we, we want to talk about things at the very end of this world's history. And of course, how many of us does that possibly involve? Don't we believe we live, we're living in the time of the end, not the end of time, but the time of the end? So we'll talk more about that when we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We hope we haven't got you too confused, but let's try a few more things and see if we can pull it together. Why does this verse, Revelation 12, 17, suggest that the dragon is apparently making war only against the final remnant of the seed? Uh, wouldn't you say that the devil's been fighting against God's people since he first started in heaven? Isn't that true? Is, is there only a few left? Well, there might be only a few left at the, but is there going to be, is there a reason to believe that the devil is going to especially fight against these last few? Final desperate attempt to take over God's kingdom. Sure, this is the devil's, I mean, he knows this is curtains for him, doesn't he? This is the last curtain call. There's no more time after this. So the devil is going to do everything and God is going to do what? God's going to step back a little bit and let him have a relatively free hand. And we believe that that's what happens in the seven last plagues, right? So if Satan can eliminate every last Christian, then Satan has the world to hit, the earth to That's hit. what he would like to do. He would like to say, okay, all the Christians are gone or they're dead. God, you can take them, do what you like with them, but leave this world to me and my people. We're the ones who are left here. And what's God's response going to be? No way. I'm going to make this world my future headquarters. And the devil knows at that point that it's curtains for him, right? You know, <clears throat> if that's the way it's going to be, and we're discussing it here tonight, certainly the devil has knows. heard us talking about these things. Yes. So we were the first ones to inform him. What, 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 how does he think he's really going to pull this off? I mean, here we're pretty simple mortals, and we've figured it out. Yeah. How is it that... Uh, well, I think the best answer is the devil's a maniac. What percent of the people on this earth follow him as opposed to follow God? Yeah. <coughs> I'm not asking so about the, how many in the universe. I'm asking about on this, mm -hmm. on this planet. But that still doesn't answer his question. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I think that's why the devil thinks that he has a chance. Oh. Yeah. Oh, he's so he thinks here on this earth he has a chance. He knows that he's lost in the rest of the universe, but he's hoping that here on this earth, he has a chance. He has more of us following him than he had angels following him in heaven. Mm -hmm. But if God is dead set on making this earth the headquarters, mm -hmm. how can he even have hope? The devil? Yeah. Well, logically, he can't possibly have hope. His own Disneyland. Well, he's, he's, okay. He's so far in, what Maybe. else is he going to do? Maybe we haven't quite hit on exactly what he's trying to do. We're close, but we're not okay. there yet. And that's why, that's why we're making him into a lunatic, because it we don't really sense. understand it, what, why he's trying to do what he's trying to do yet. And he's well, a very smart he's being. He's up to no good. I, I have, a, I have a, uh, an ontological question here. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> um, I hope I used the right word there. Yeah. Um, is the devil really a victim? Um, you know, we paint him as a very, um, a very calculating and, and he, 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 he's really in total control. But is he too a victim of this thing that called sin? Mm -hmm. has, has, has sin overtaken him? Yes. He has been telling lies so long that he's come to believe them. Mm -hmm. Well, but more than that, I... Well, that's just a start. I know that's not right, the whole I know, story. I know, but what I'm, what I'm saying here is, does sin have a nature all of its own? And he has fallen subject to that as well. But that's... never heard anybody ask that question before, even think along those lines, but I was just... Yeah, I've just wondered about that if, you know, it's, you know... He's gotten involved in this thing, and he is entrapped in whatever this sin does to us. Yeah. But don't you think that sin would need a medium to propagate out? Mm -hmm. And he's, he made a decision to become that medium. So in a way, um, he's victimizing himself. Mm -hmm. And how can that happen? I mean, well, I mean that, 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 that all makes well, sense, and well, I... And I and I don't have any answer. It's just, a, it's just a, a question I've, you know, we seem to blame him for everything, <clears throat> and I'm not trying to get him off on anything, 
but you know, I'm just wondering if he hasn't become a victim of the very thing he turned well, to Well, here's what we have. In the New Testament, we have references to things like Jesus is coming back and so forth, but no specific prophecies really, real detailed prophecies until we come to the book of Revelation. So we have a 2,000 year period at least, because Christ hasn't come back yet, that has been covered by one book. So what do we have? We have little windows, and we're traveling along here, we're peeking in this window, and we're peeking in that window, we're peeking in that window, and we're trying to, and we're just sort of zooming by as we're doing that, and we're trying to figure out what it's all about. Clearly, we don't know the whole story, but we're getting just enough so that we can get an overall picture of what's going on. There's going to be a lot more. I'm sure we, there's, we're going to be, there's going to be so much more, we say, wow, when we really see it. Well, you know, we are victims when we dabble in sin. People mm -hmm. dabble in drugs, and before they know it, they're hooked, mm -hmm. and they may even kill themselves or whatever. You dabble in alcohol, you dabble in gambling, mm -hmm. and it takes you away. Mm -hmm. That's why God says, don't even go there. And so Satan may be his prime example. He dabbled in... Yeah. He wasn't forced into his position. No. No. He was dealt with for a long period of time before he finally committed made it a total commitment. Well, in Revelation 13, 7 and 8, let's jump back there and have a look at that. It was allowed to fight. This is clearly talking about the dragon. It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them, and it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people living on earth will worship it, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the Book of the Living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. Now, uh, we looked at this question about the Book of the Living earlier. Here it is talking about again. And God, What's it saying? This is saying that God can predict the end from the beginning, right? And, But here on this earth, it looks like Satan's about to win, right? <clears throat> we see the beast from the sea is allowed to make war against God's few, for a few faithful people. He's even allowed to conquer them and to defeat them. Now looking at Revelation 16, 13, and 14... We're, we're looking at the next window here. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. So back in Revelation 13, it seems like everybody's um, you know, following the beast. And here we see him pulling everybody together, even the kings. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to make war against God, right? Does that suggest that the war which began in heaven so long ago has never ended? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Doesn't it seem so? The war that will not end until God has recreated the heavens and the earth and the righteous are living with him, on the, that war will not end until they live, we're living in, with God on the new earth, Revelation 21 and 22, which we'll get to hopefully before too much longer. Doesn't that reflect what we know from human history? Absolutely, the war never seems to end. And we've, we know who's, who's always pushing the war, don't we? Now, these ten kings, what do we know about them? They're united in supporting the beast and the dragon. Unitedly, they will make war on the, ram, the Lamb, but finally this time the Lamb will fight against them and conquer them. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, etc. But we're still not done with the war theme because we read a further retelling of the story in Revelation 19.19. 19. Look at that. I mean, we haven't got to that yet. But 19.19 says, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to fight against the one who was riding the horse and against his army. So there's more war to come, right? Okay, so how far does it go? Is it adding something more? Doesn't this suggest that the war continues? Does it sound like Revelation 17? It's more and more of the same, isn't it? Thus, scattered through the book of Revelation, we see many references which specifically talk about war. And I've got a list of about 20 of them in, in the handout. Starting from Re Revelation 2.16 through chapter 20, verses 7 to 10. The dragon himself leads out in final effort to conquer God and his people. I mean, what do you do when you're, 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 you're in a corner and you know you're losing? You fight as hard as you can, right? Now, this is the time after he's been released from the pit. 
Yeah. Right? And so we've got time from there to some time when all this is over with. Do we have any idea how long that time is? Well, that's Revelation 20. So why don't we okay. hold on for that? Now, you have a lot of this spelled out in the handouts. Have you told the viewers where they can get the handout? Well, the, you can get the handout on our website. That's theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot org. Okay? So, we're going to suggest that the one who has promoted war, who's pushed war, who's fought from beginning to end, the whole history of the great controversy is Satan himself. He started in heaven. He's continuing to fight against God's people. But it seems like as we come to the end of this world's history, he's going to be determined even more to fight even harder. So he fights against God's people and he gets other people to fight against God's people. And he fights against all. Who's he really trying to fight against? God. God. But he can't get to God, so he fights against God's people as representing God, right? Well, who do you, since we've suggested he is the one who started the war in heaven, who is he fighting against in heaven? Jesus. Michael, the archangel, we've, we've suggested uh, that that's Jesus. If you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 13 to 17, you see that the archangel's trumpet sounds, and if you go back and the dead rise at the sound of the trumpet, we go to, back to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. It says the dead will rise at the voice of Jesus. So Jesus is equated with Michael the archangel. So it's not God's idea to fight. It was the devil's idea to fight. And the, fight seem, the fighting, the war seems to go on interminably. So now we're going to suggest that this book of Revelation is specifically talking about what happens in the very end. It suggests that there's a conflict, a war going on. It's certainly not over. The final outcome, however, is not what we said last time. Not in doubt. Who's going to win? God is going to win. And how is he going to win? Is he going to win because he's more powerful? No, he doesn't win by being more powerful. He wins by telling the truth. And where do we, where do we find that truth? Who's the central leader in that truth? Jesus. Jesus Christ. The questions of the great controversy were answered by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by the words in the Bible which God and Jesus gave to us. That's what we have access to uh, yeah. about that story. So do we know how the devil is going to be defeated? Isn't that what we want to know now? How is he going to finally be defeated? Um, and we've asked, you know, if you're fighting against God, a cannon's not going to do any good, atomic bomb's not going to do any good. How do you fight against God? You tell lies about him. You tell lies, you slander him, you misrepresent him, and so forth. How does God win? Demonstrate God. the truth. And he, he needs people who what? <coughs> do what is right because it is right. He needs people who in total freedom said, I'm on God's side, I will not change, I'm not going to follow the devil. Even if the devil is standing in front of us like this, we're saying, no, Satan, I will not accept your lies, I don't believe your misrepresentations. My Bible says. Okay. So when these people are presented, like you have in here, like looters, they're presented with a... Um, an open store, no one's in it, yeah. they will not go in and take anything. Well, let's tell that story. There's a very interesting story that happened some years ago, and so people have probably forgotten about it, but Alexander Solzhenitsyn, remember, was a famous Russian author, was allowed to leave Russia and go to Harvard to give a graduation speech in 1978, at the height of the Cold War. To the consternation of many, he suggested that in the war between the free world led by the United States and the unfree world led in those days primarily by USSR, neither side had the final answer. And what was his winning argument? During the previous winter, just a few months before he gave his speech, there was that incredible experience when the electricity went out in much of the city of New York for three or four days. And what was the result? 
people went out and stole everything they could possibly get their hands on. Something similar happened in Iraq when Saddam Hussein fell. Convictions about freedom do not amount to much of anything when they all go out the window just because the electricity goes out. Quiet neighborhoods turn into what in effect was a war zone, a neighborhood of looters. This tells us that the only real freedom is possible when you have what kind of people? People who do right because it is right. People who do right because it is right and they're convinced that that's the only way to live according to the laws of love and God's principles. So God has been trying to say all along that that's the only way you can have a universe to survive for eternity is to live according to the laws of love and, and save and like that's the only safe way. But we have a very interesting uh, quotation from Mellon White that comments about that. Desire of Ages, page 761, paragraph 3. Now this is in the little chapter called It Is Finished, and it's a sort of a summary of what's happened to Christ's life right just before that and what was accomplished by his death. It says, yet Satan was not then destroyed. I mean, if you've already answered all the questions, why not get rid of him? The angels did not even then under... Who? The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And how are they going to be revealed? For the sake of man, Satan's existence must be continued. Man as well as angels must see the contrast between the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. Desire of Ages 761, paragraph 3. So, doesn't that sound like what we're reading here at the end of Revelation? So we're going to see truth and we're going to mm -hmm. see lies and we have to choose what kind of person we're going to be. So, what have we seen in the great controversy story so far? Does it seem like God is winning? Mm. Well, not up to this point. It seems like the devil is pretty successful. In Revelation 13, you would say, wow, it looks like he's going to win the war, doesn't it? <clears throat> I'm still having the trouble when at the end, every mm. knee shall bow. Yeah. What does that? Well, again, you're jumping ahead of us, but... But you asked the question. Yeah. You said, how, how is it going to yeah. win? Right. And that's going to be it, that everybody's going to bow. Yeah. And how that happens... Yeah. It's going to happen because God's going to fill the sky with the story of the great controversy from beginning to end and what's referred to as a panorama. But and Satan will do the same thing. He will bow also. Yeah. So the, the story is going to... does it. What? The panorama does it. Yeah. The story is so compelling. The story is going to be so obvious. The answer is going to be so obvious. And the, the, who's right and who's wrong is going to be so compelling that everybody's going to be on their knees temporarily to, to be sure. And what's Satan going to do as soon as the panorama is over? Now we're jumping ahead to Revelation 20, but what's he going to do as soon as the panorama is over? over? He's going to jump up and say, we've got everything ready, let's attack the city. And then what's going to be the result? They're going to turn on him. Destroyed. You've mentioned several times the term or two where it's great controversy. Can you briefly say okay. what is meant by the great controversy? Yes. We're suggesting by referring to the great controversy, we're talking about the war between God and Satan. And it's a, a war over who's going to control the universe. And the only way Satan has of even having a remote possibility of winning is by misrepresenting, slandering, lying, etc. about God. It's, a, it's, it's a, a war over the character of God and whether we believe him, whether we want to live like him, whether we want to be like him. That's what the war is over. And the war takes place where? In our heads. Between our ears. Yeah, in our heads. Are we convinced by Satan's arguments? Are we convinced by God's arguments? Are we even seeing those arguments? Are we clearly representing those arguments to you, our audience, for example? I hope that some of this, at least, is clear. This is not just a war between good and bad. It's much more specific than that. It is that, but it's much more detailed than that. It means we need to talk about what Satan is doing to try to misrepresent God and how God responds by revealing the truth. That's really what this is about, okay? Okay. 
Isn't it God's intention to allow things to continue until, until every single possible question about his character and government has been answered? But before bringing things to an end, is God going to allow Satan to reveal his full hand to see what it would be like to live in a world controlled by the devil? Looks like it, doesn't it? Probably the most influential theologian in the academic community in the 20th century was a Swiss theologian by the name of Karl Barth. And, and Barth said, now that once Jesus had lived and died and answered the questions, what's the purpose of going on anymore? Why doesn't Jesus just come? He couldn't explain it. He doesn't That's, have the great controversy. He didn't have the great controversy. In spite of his over, what, six or 7,000 pages, he still yeah. doesn't, didn't understand yeah. the great controversy. Well, a little lady who had a third grade education wrote 100,000 pages and she knew. Okay. Doesn't the story of Genesis 3 suggest that an alienation has taken place between God and his children? This alienation was brought upon us by the serpent in the garden. And we know who was behind him, right? Satan. A reconciliation is needed, and that reconciliation needs to involve the entire universe. And the Bible clearly spells that out. Um, if we had time, I would read you. But let me just refer you to those passages. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. Chapter, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. And then let me read you this word, this one verse, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. For it seems to me that God has given, this is of course is Paul talking, not John. For it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles. Maybe he felt like he was living in the end of this world's history. Like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle, and the Greek word is theater. We are on the stage for the whole world of angels and of humanity. God's people are a spectacle, a theater for the whole universe to watch. What verse is that? That was 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. Okay, so let's just take some specific examples. What has the world learned, what has the universe learned, for that matter, from the Holocaust? That evil exists. Not much. There is no rational way to explain the Holocaust without talking about the devil. There is no rational way to talk about it without talking about the devil. So. Where is this all going to end? Well, we looked at Revelation 16, 13, and 14 already, um, and Revelation 17. Let, let me just drop down near the end of Revelation 17, and what happens there? Let's read verses, um, well, let's start with verse 15. Once again, the angel also said to me, the waters you saw in which the prostitute is sitting are nations, peoples, races, and languages. Are they involved in what's happening in the next verse? The ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will take away everything she has and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and destroy her with fire. What is that talking about? That's talking about problems in Satan's side, right? They're going to fight against each other and destroy each other, right? Well, the harlot, is, isn't that the perverse church? Yeah. Okay, and then they're going to hate her. Yeah. So they don't even want have anything to do with any kind of religion. Yeah, that's which they did. They did back in them, 17 and with the French Revolution. Yeah. They t tried that experiment. Experiment. Okay, and now we got a couple more things to talk about. What about Armageddon? We've already talked about that some. The word comes from a, a Hebrew word. In fact, two Hebrew words: Har Moed. There's no other rational way to explain it. And that harmoed means the mount of assembly. And if we be go back to Isaiah 14, 13, the mount of assembly is where God's throne is. And who's always wanted to sit in God's throne? Satan. Satan. So this final war is going to be the final attempt by Satan to take God down so he can, he can, he can sit in his place. Is he going to succeed? No. In light of all that we have studied so far, we firmly believe that this is a reference to the Mount of Assembly mentioned in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. You can read about it right there, specifically in verse 13. The place where God reigns. That is where the cosmic battle began. This is a contrast over heavenly supremacy. And we might add, when God brings his, his 
uh, earth that is thrown down to this earth, it will be where the conflict ends. The, co the contested territory is God's throne. That's what the devil is fighting for. And all of the people he's gotten involved in, etc., are all just puppets in this whole thing. It's really the devil's attempt to take over God's throne. The devil's goal has never changed. Will the demon dragon finally succeed in sitting in that chair? Well, how is God going to going to defeat him in the end? Look at verse 17 of Revelation 17. For God has placed in their hearts the will to carry out his purpose by acting together and giving the beast their power to rule until God's words come true. God has said, if you let sin go to, to seed, it will destroy itself. He said back in the very beginning, Genesis 2, 17, sin leads to death. And finally, God is going to say, okay, Satan, take over, do your worst. What's going to be the result? Satan's side will destroy itself. It'll fight each other. They will destroy themselves. So, what do we what do we come to in the last few minutes that we have here? Um, the woman we have suggested we're going to come to some conclusions. The woman represents organized religion. The waters, as Revelation seventeen fifteen says, are people. The beast that was and is not and is to come represents Satan. The one, in that passage, has a Roman connotation. It may be imperial Rome or religious Rome or probably both. It's scattered out in, in, in John's day. It was the imperial Rome that was a problem. In our day, it might be the religious Rome. Then five, we have not yet identify, identified the other. It is characterized as a future phenomenon. In general, Adventist commentators have believed that this refers to the United States of America. We will study that in more detail later. So the ten kings are ten are world powers and probably refer to the same powers that were referred to in Daniel's ten toes. So what have we have we come to some kind of conclusion? I believe we've identified most of the important characters here in um, this chapter, and we've talked about the theme, we've talked about what Satan's trying to accomplish and what God's trying to accomplish, and I hope you've had fun with us. See you next time.